Good morning, Lost Creek. I've often said that one of the main reasons that I am a United Methodist is because of our Wesleyan understanding of grace. Prevenient, justifying, sanctifying grace, describing how God's grace is active in our lives from our birth to our death, through all stages of our faith, even when there's no faith at all. That concept of grace describes what I read about in the scriptures, as well as my own personal experiences. And as a pastor, this understanding of grace is what I use to guide people along their own disciple journeys. This understanding of God's grace opens me to an awareness of God's love that is continually motivating God's actions in this world. Long ago, one night, Jesus had a conversation with a man named Nicodemus. And he told Nicodemus that God was finished condemning this world and the people in it. Jesus announced to him that God was motivated now by a love that would draw people closer, wooing them preveniently, even before they've ever heard the name of God, preventing anyone from straying so far as to be beyond the redemptive grasp of God. Prevenient grace uh, guides each of us to a moment of justifying grace in which miraculously we experience a, a, a regeneration. Our hearts are strangely warmed. We are born again. And from that moment, we dive headlong into the waters of sanctification that will guide us on throughout the remainder of our days as we learn, mature, and grow in our love for God and other people, what John Wesley called Christian perfection. As amazing as this grace seems, it simply means that God never lets us go. God never gives up on us. I can't help but wonder, would another denomination or an independent congregation rest so securely on these convictions of grace? Might they prescribe precisely who was or who was not an eligible beneficiary of God's amazing grace? Another reason I'm a United Methodist is because of our understanding of our baptism. God's grace is far reaching and strong but there is brokenness from which we all need redemption and rescue. The, the waters of our baptism hearken us back to the stories of Noah and remind us that not only is there judgment, but there is also hope and promise. Our baptism seals us within God's promise. I do not experience baptism alone. I am not just imitating something that Jesus did. I am baptized within a covenant community of God's people. Baptism is an observable sign of God's active grace on my behalf. Its power rests solely in the hands and heart of God and not upon myself my understanding, or my age. Infants and the aged are equally beneficiaries of this amazing grace. I wonder, would another denomination or an independent congregation reduce the power of baptism to just a human understanding or an obedience? Would the waters of baptism be restricted to only those of a certain age or an understanding? Would a prescribed amount of water be required to ensure cleansing and acceptance? 
Simply, none of those modifications would be acceptable to me. Another reason I'm a United Methodist is because of our understanding of the Lord's table, acting upon our understanding of grace, and acknowledging that all are welcome at this feast. A tiny morsel of bread and a sip of juice that my tongue barely tastes nourishes my soul in ways that I can't fully explain or comprehend. Anyone is welcome at this feast. I wonder, would a denomination or an independent congregation reduce the reach of this table to a specific congregational group or a sect? Would its power be reduced to a symbol? That to me would be more like a fast food snack than the rich Sunday dinner feast that I experience at the Lord's table. Another reason I'm a United Methodist is because I stand on a foundation of clear Orthodox Christian doctrine and a sense of an apostolic faith that transcends my own personal experience and even my lifetime. Christian doctrine has a certain elasticity and stretch to it. I once heard a, a metaphor describing Christian doctrine as a baseball diamond, with fair play, so to speak, being between the first baseline and the third baselines. And foul balls, so to speak, would be beyond those lines and outside the reach of traditional Orthodox Christian doctrine. Well, through time, uh, among valid Christian expression, our doctrines stretch and they move and, and change in their expressions uh, between one point on the first baseline, maybe, and another point on the third baseline, maybe. And so at any point on that doctrine, you can believe between here and there and be confident that you're remaining within the boundaries of an orthodox Christian faith. As a United Methodist, not only do I rest my faith on, on our doctrinal standards as expressed in the Articles of Religion, but I also learn from the development of our social principles. These principles represent efforts by conferences to bring these ancient Christian doctrines into our ever-changing and modern world. The discussions and, and decisions that lead to these principles evolve over time, and they are virtually constantly revised and, and changed. They cover a huge range of issues that are important to us all, such as war, collective bargaining and ethical practices in the workplace, civil rights, abortion, education, divorce, alcohol consumption and addiction, uh, the death penalty, the use of tobacco, technology in our modern world, gambling, and yes, human sexuality, just to name a few. If you ever read through these social principles, you will find a wealth of wise Christian counsel. And you'll experience something of that baseball diamond that I mentioned. Each issue will be considered through the lens of, of our faith, our church tradition, scripture, understanding, and human experience. And on, on almost each issue, you'll find yourself nodding, saying, yes, I can, I can see that. You will not find many of these statements written in terms of a United Methodist must believe this or a United Methodist must do that. But you will be given a range in which to form your thoughts and understandings and opinions and be assured that you remain within the boundaries 
of your denomination and our historical Orthodox Christian faith. Now, most Christian denominations will share a similar understanding of Orthodox Christian doctrine. This for me is why I would find it difficult to be a part of an independent non-denominational congregation, especially uh, when those churches are mid-size or smaller. Oftentimes, doctrines can rest upon strong opinions within the church among leaders or their pastor. Unfortunately, very often, pastors of those smaller non-denominational churches have little, if any, uh, formal theological instruction. I know the last time that I worshiped at a very small non-denominational congregation, I listened uh, to a sermon from a pastor who had had no uh, formal theological instruction. And the sermon I heard was passionately delivered with great conviction. Fortunately, as I listened, there were more than a few of his points that fell outside those first and third base lines and framework of classic Orthodox Christian doctrine, and no one noticed. Now, the last theological issue that I want to raise with you in this video is the status of women and minorities within the leadership and pastorate of a congregation. Now, we have to own the fact that it's barely been 70 years since the United Methodist Church acknowledged the ordination of women, but at least we got there. Yeah. The biblical basis claimed by some of those restricting women from these roles are simply misapplications of a few verses. It's quite clear that the Apostle Paul, who happened to write some of those very verses, also writes many more times in which he clearly approves of, acknowledges, and supports women in leadership, pastoral, and apostolic roles within the early church. This is just so fundamentally clear to me that I just find it difficult to understand why a modern woman would want to be in that kind of restrictive environment. And I need to stop there before I start preaching. Currently, the most active advocates for disaffiliation are the Wesleyan Covenant Association and a new denomination that is forming named the Global Methodist Church. Now, one would expect that since they use the name Methodist in their name, uh, that they would remain true to Wesleyan theology and doctrinal standards. But we simply don't know. I have seen on social media churches that have disaffiliated who have wiped the name of Methodism from all of their publications and their, all of their social media sites. The GMC has existed for less than a year. They simply don't have solid doctrinal standards yet. They have draft proposals for procedures and doctrinal standards, but a lot can happen between the draft and the final copy. It's just way too early for me to sign on with that right now. The path would actually be even more difficult for a congregation that was choosing to remain independent in the very temporal sense, the first thing they would need to do would be to reestablish themselves as a, as a viable corporation that was recognized as a nonprofit organiz organization and a church. Then that group would need to hammer out their theological doctrine standards for themselves. Now that task has kept Christian scholars busy for over 2,000 years, so good luck with that one. Unfortunately, I have a hunch that many of those folks will simply settle for a vague sense of what I believe and a shallow understanding of what the Bible says. Many will be listening to error on Sunday mornings and will not react to it because Pastor Jim is just a good old guy. And there probably won't be a Pastor Jane, but I can't go there. 
Maybe you've never thought of yourself as a theologian, but you are. Theology, doctrine, and the practice of those doctrines are important. And I hope you have considered in these moments your own sense of doctrine, why you believe what you believe. And maybe I've led you to experience some new thoughts along the way. Now, the best news is you don't have to agree with me on every single point. That elasticity that I mentioned earlier covers that. So, as we close in prayer, in, in, in one conversation Jesus had comes to mind. A man pled with him, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Two words that have so much power and potential. When we think about God or talk about God, there's a reason why we say, I believe, more often than we say, I know. Because in pretty short order on this journey of faith, God's reality exceeds our ability to know our comprehension and enters the realm of mystery. And there, we can only believe. I actually draw comfort from the conviction that when we finally see God and see as God sees and know as God knows, we will all have some things about which we say, well, I was wrong about that one. And so as we pray today, I'm actually using a prayer that I often pray at a graveside. Eternal God, help us so to believe where we have not yet seen that your presence may lead us through our years and bring us at last into the joy of your home, not made with hands, but eternal in the heavens, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.